What is up, everybody? Welcome back. 41st edition of the Orion Podcast. I am Chad Brock. And I'm Zach Bailiff. Let's get this thing started. Let's do it. After a three-week hiatus, the boys are back. We're back. Yeah, about time. I know, man. It feels good. It feels good to be back. Got everything plugged in. The lights are on. It's it's like I about forgot man. how to work it all. I know it was uh, what we had Halloween, and then it was like I had uh, stuff going on the next week for something else, and then nope. yeah, it was like, and now here we are. Here, here we are. are. It feels good. You got a good hunt in last week. I got some fishing in. The world is right again. Podcast It'll be even better once I get back in the woods. <laughs> yeah, I guarantee you that. You do. You do. Whitetail season is in full swing. What is up, Miss Jean? Mr. Charlie, what is going on? We got some people in the house tonight. I like it. I like it. They're probably excited yeah. about our guest. I think we should uh, like probably so. half hour. We, yeah, should, just we should probably of, talk for a half hour and then let yeah. them just like get bored with us and then bring our guest on. But nah, we won't do that because we got an important guest on tonight. So should we start it? Let's get started. Let's get started. Let's do it. We're out of practice. We need yeah. we need more practice. From Wired to Fish, he is a publisher. He's a COO. He is the man with the new Jackson kayak. Welcome. Jason Seelockett, man, how are you? Good. How are y'all, fellas? Good, man. Good. Doing well. Long- Haven't got a chat with you for a hot minute. We've been texting back and forth, and thanks for uh, thanks for jumping on this thing, man. We we're stoked to have you on here because Zach and I are both nerds in the sense that we were big dorks when it was come to reading the early days of wired to fish uh, yep. on the website and early days of YouTube. We were the, we were your dorks that absorbed everything that you guys put out there for a long time. You guys in a lot of ways taught us a lot about fishing and we're pretty stoked about that. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I appreciate it. Now we're, uh, that's kind of what we are. We're big dorks about fishing too. So we are big dorks making content for other fishing dorks. <laughs> so yeah. No, I, it's like <laughs> I'm a dork when it comes to anything outdoor related, which is why I built an entire bench dedicated to building arrows. So, <laughs> yeah, we're we're kindred spirits. Then I've got like 47 do it molds out in the garage, and <laughs> yeah. so I'm always tinkering, uh-huh. and building stuff, and changing stuff, and yeah, yeah. You got to. You never know when you might find something that works just a little bit better. Right. Right. Well, uh, it's it's like all the way back in Iconelli's books. Funny that we were talking about Iconelli before this started. Um, we're all tinkers in our own way. We're all collectors, and you know that was one of the one of the biggest things I think I took away from that book when I read it for the first time was that you know we're collectors, and there's always more colors and always more allures, and gosh, they just you can't ever have enough. It's no. I mean it just creates a junkie in us all, mm-hmm. but. Um, yeah, so Jason, thank you again for being here tonight. Um, we're going to jump into this thing. So one of the things that we do on the Orion podcast, because it's kind of a tell your story type of thing. Um, we always ask, like, how did you get started in the outdoors? What what led you to this passion that you've created um, for yourself? 
Sure. Well, of course, I'm probably like most guys. Their their dad or somebody in their family was into fishing and took them a little bit as a kid. And so dad took me a little bit. He was uh, in the Navy. So we were we moved around a lot. <laughs> and so um, I've lived in 17 states. Um, so I have fished all over the country. I joke with people. There's only like five states now that I have left on my list to have caught a fish in every state. Um, so yeah, so when we had downtime, whether we were traveling or whatever, that fishing was kind of what we did. Um, and then when I got into, you know, fifth, sixth grade and could kind of venture out into the woods on my own, that's kind of when it really took a hold of me. And so hopping farm ponds around the house or whatever, getting in the creeks and, and doing that stuff, I cut my teeth creek fishing in the Ozark streams um, in Arkansas. So I lived in Arkansas for a period when I was kind of in that age when you get into bass fishing, you know, middle school age and then going into early high school before we moved to Florida. And then so I just pers- kept pursuing it once we moved to Florida. Obviously, that's a great place to live and <laughs> be interested in fishing. So oh, yeah. a little bit. A little bit. <laughs> So, yeah, my high school years, I was very into saltwater fishing. We lived in the uh, Crystal River area, so just north of Tampa um, on the Gulf Coast. And so I, you couldn't talk to me about a bass. All I wanted to do was go chase redfish and sea trout and that kind of stuff and chase tarpon and snook and <laughs> whatever else we could get into there, kind of on the oyster bars just out from the from the land. So um, I spent pretty much all my high school years doing that. Um, and then came back to Arkansas and met my wife and got into fly fishing in Arkansas that around that time. And of course was hot and heavy into bass fishing and was on the Skeeter state team when I was in Arkansas. And I got approached by, um, one of the mag or one of the newspapers there. I had sent a, a note to them. They had some errors in one of their stories. And, and so the person replied back and said, I appreciate it or whatever. And, I said, well, I write and photograph a little bit if you ever need help. And they were like, oh, we need tons of help. <laughs> and so I started <laughs> writing for the newspaper kind of as a side gig. I was doing IT was, is the world I come from. So I was working for the bank group that um, the Walton family had founded to handle their Walmart money. And uh, so I was doing IT full time and started doing the writing photography thing on the side. And so started with some local newspapers and got to work in um, doing freelance work for game and fish magazines, um, started doing freelance work for FLW and FLW was coming every year to Beaver Lake. And that's where we lived was in Rogers. And, uh, they were coming every year to do the Walmart open back in the Walmart days of FLW. Mm -hmm. And so I was working those events every time they would come, got to be really good friends with all the staff at FLW. And so I got a call out of the blue, um, from Dave Washburn, who was running the magazines at the time and was like, Hey, you want to come do this full time? I was like, uh, I don't know. <laughs> and so I talked it over with my wife and I was like, look, you know, I said when I was 13, I was going to go work for a fishing magazine. You know, at the time, my dream job was to go be the editor of Bassmaster. And I said, you know, I kind of told myself as a kid, I was going to do that. Why don't we just take a shot and try this. And if it doesn't pan out, I'll go back and do it and you know, whatever. Yeah. I, I don't want to be 20 years down the road and go, man, you should have took a chance and tried that. And oh, yeah. so we, uh, we took the leap of faith, moved to Kentucky. Don't know. Didn't know a person here except Dave Washburn. Um, <laughs> didn't have any family here. My son was two years old. So my wife was very embedded in her teaching job in Arkansas and um, but yeah, we basically pulled up stakes and went to the unknown. I took a huge pay cut to come <laughs> work for FLW. So, I mean, it was a drastic lifestyle change for us. And, um, but it was one of those leap of faith things. And I was like, you hey, look, if it doesn't work out, I'll just, I'll bail and go back and do it and just do it on the side or whatever. And fortunately for me, it worked out great. Um, the guy who was the editor soon left. Dave had moved up in the company and another person was running the magazines. He ended up leaving. I was like, well, I'd like to take a chance at it. I had been doing the photo editor work and the associate editor work there. And so Kathy Fennell gave me a shot. And next thing I know, I'm running all the magazines at FLW. At the time, we had like a saltwater magazine, a walleye magazine, a bass magazine. Um, so I was running I that. Those. Yeah, I was running that for FLW. And then eventually we 
condensed it back down and just did the bass magazine once those other circuits went away they dropped the saltwater circuits and um dropped the walleye circuits and just went back to bass so i did that and then um, in 2008, Wired to Fish had launched, and I had been friends with Terry Brown back when he was at Bass Fan, and mm-hmm. for about a year, and realized uh, we need somebody to come do content. We can't just do press releases and <laughs> you know put up stuff from tournaments, and it's like we need somebody to actually help us build content. So they reached out to me, and I was like, you know, I think the digital thing sounds fun. I think the magazine thing might be going away, and the digital thing might be growing, and that's back when everybody was just starting to get into Facebook. There wasn't even an Instagram yet. <laughs> you know? right. So, um, so yeah, I, I, I jumped ship and went over to wire to fish and, and I still love all the people at FLW. I go to lunch every couple of weeks with Dave Washburn. I see Kathy all the time. So I still love those people. We parted on great terms. I think the world of them and, um, but yeah, so we, I started at wire to fish in 2010 and they basically gave me carte blanche, like, all right, what would you change? What are we doing wrong? What should we add? And let me basically design it from scratch. So I think at the time we had like 6,000 people on Facebook right. when I started. And I think now we're at like 1.2 million. So it was a fun ride of that. <laughs> and all that growth was organic. So people, yeah. Yeah. people would tell stories and say, oh, they bought all those people. No, we, we never paid for any of that. <laughs> back, back when the algorithms were good and you could actually yes. grow organically. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> it feels like a hundred years ago. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. <laughs> I've been on suicide watch with the algorithm changes on Facebook this year. So, <laughs> yeah, you ain't <laughs> yeah, that's you're talking to two social media managers. It's nuts. It's, yeah, it's, it's got awesome. us smashing our heads up against the wall for sure. Yeah, I, I um, sat in on a thing today with uh, one of the ad networks, basically talking about how all the creators are crying the blues because they're just like Google. Oh changed if facebook's changed like yeah but it was nice to hear like okay well i'm not the only one on an island yeah and where'd all my traffic go like so right we're all in the same boat yeah (laughs) we're all looking at it scratching our heads trying different plug and piece and you know is there is there a rhythm is there you know it's it's not so if you're at home if it's from three people (laughs) that do this every day if you're not getting the views that you think you should be getting Keep trying. Don't just give you, a yeah. worse I have dealing with it. I had one take off a little bit a couple of weeks ago, and I still to this day I have no idea why or for what yeah. reason. So, and I think you're going to see a lot of changes. So th- this has happened before. This isn't the first time. It's it's mm-hmm. been like this. You know, I think there'll be, there'll be an adjustment. Oh, break. There'll be another algorithm change. And of course, you know, but I think part of this is a is a knee jerk reaction to AI. So. Mm-hmm. They're making a lot of heavy handed changes to try to rule out this fake content that's, you know, becoming yeah. really prolific out there. So, yeah. I think, you know, they get a handle on that. The algorithm will get better. And, and, and Google's, you know, to their credit, they're really trying to make it where the good content creators are buoyed to the top, right? And it's, yeah. you're not competing with this AI bot content. So, yeah, I mean, everybody, these guys sitting on these AI generators, just sitting around typing in a, a list of things that they want in a piece of content and the AI just producing it. And know. They never had to leave their computer. Yeah. We don't, you know, we don't want to play the games there where it's, you know, mm-hmm. you're doing things for clicks. And so we're, we're very much about making content yeah. that helps the angling community. And I think if yeah. you'll, if you'll stick to that, then you're it's all gonna wash out. You're gonna be okay. If you're yeah. actually making genuine content to help people providing that answers, yeah. yeah, that answers what they need, yep. you'll be fine. So yep. providing think, value. You know, with, that's where it's at. With uh with the article, you actually had written the um the kayak, the 2023 kayak buyer's guide. And I that was a process that I luckily got to help you or be involved with with you and and it was it was really genuine, and and for the folks at home that don't know this or didn't read that, fancy the pictures for that matter. Jason actually physically went out and tested every kayak in the buyer's guide. So the feedback that you're getting is is very genuine, and I think that is one of the coolest things. I know you've got a couple more that you're working on for buyer's guides, and and you guys are doing the same thing. You're genuinely testing each product, which I think is a testament to Wired to Fish, not just throwing out something that's 
fictitious information just because there was a dollar amount involved or, or whatever. Yeah. It's, it's genuine content. Yeah. That's the thing. Like, so you'll have, you know, some companies that want to be in it, that you know, you test their stuff and they're, eh, no, I can't really recommend it. So, so you deal with a lot of that getting, you know, rounding up products, you know, we buy about half of it. We get sent about half of it, like the kayak thing, like some of those inflatable and fold, like they were sending them and I was sending them back. And it, I mean, so it was like a constant back and forth of shipping kayaks. And then fortunately I was able like the way you did, it's the way I preferred to do it with everyone is like, tell me where to go, bring all your kayaks, let me get in every one of them so I can be hands-on with everyone. I can speak intelligently about it, you know? So right. that's my whole thing. And so that, it, that makes our process a lot longer than some of like the content farms we compete against because <laughs> mm -hmm. you know, they're going out and seeing, well, what's number one on Amazon and just churning out a piece of content. And yeah, I, yeah. I can in good conscience do that, you know, like yeah. I definitely can't recommend things that I've, that I've been hands on with and had a bad experience with. So yeah, I yeah, mean, you, you never know slower and tougher, but yeah, it's, I think it's worthwhile to the angling community to do it that way. Yeah. I mean, you've got to put hands on something. You can't just sit back and look at a photo and you don't know once you sit in a boat, what the layout of things is and if it's actually going to be conducive to efficient fishing on, the, you know, and work on the water and, and things of that nature just by looking at it on a screen. Right. So, yeah. And we do our best to be, you know, to try to touch things that would appeal to a wide, you know, group of people. So everyone has different budgets. Everyone has different interests, you know, like the way I fish isn't the way you fish. So what I think is great, you might think is terrible, <laughs> you know, like, so I try to keep all that in perspective. And, you know, so I, the thing for me is I would hate, I would feel bad to recommend something to somebody, they spend their money on it. And then they, they have a terrible experience with it because I told them to go get it. So right, we, we want to avoid that at all costs. So yeah, it's, that it just, it, you know, I say all that to say it makes our process a lot longer, a lot more difficult, but I think at the end we have the better piece. So mm -hmm. Now, when you writing for Wired Fish, obviously there's a lot of there's a lot of tips, there's a lot of tricks, there's a lot of reviews. Um, do you miss the days, man, of like just telling the story? Right? Oh yeah, yeah. There's something we battle with all the time too. So I mean, because it goes both ways. You 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 do the storytelling piece, and then you don't get as many people to look at that, you know. Mm -hmm. And then the piece that doesn't, to me, doesn't seem like it has as much substance to it, but that piece goes crazy, and you're like, <sighs> you know. So that yeah, yeah. it's always the struggle. We try to do a lot of a lot of both, right? So we want to yeah. we want to do things that appeal to the masses, but we also want to do the really nitty gritty stuff. I I tell the guys like when we you know we obviously have trained up a lot of young guys over the years, and, and it's like look when you get in a boat with another angler, like you're in a boat with a pro, like scan through their boat you're a good fisherman you, you'll see the thing that sticks out and then ask them like because what we're trying to provide to the angling community is like give them a nugget give them something they don't know that you came across from like oh what is that you know like <laughs> what are you doing with that right there why is that like that like and i was like that's when you make the really good pieces if it's something that like piques your interest usually you know that's one of the that's the thing that's going to do really well when it, when you make a piece of content yeah yeah, I think it, it goes back to people's attention span right now, you know, and we, we've seen it going back and talking about the algorithm and things like that. As far as like storytelling versus the tips and tricks or the gear reviews or something they can just scan and, and pick up pieces here and there versus sitting down and reading an actual story and like kind of getting themselves immersed in it and putting themselves in the, you know, in the adventure. Folks just, they don't have the attention span for that these days, it seems like. And there are some that do, obviously. I mean, you know, that stuff gets a few clicks here and there. But overall, it's it can be frustrating because, I mean, we, we go back and forth with that with creating content as well, especially on the video side. It's, you know, you've got to keep a good mix of the technical stuff versus, you know, telling a story and, and covering an adventure and trying to make it cinematic and enjoyable. And that that's the stuff we really like to do. But like you said you gotta have both right right yeah that we we struggle with that too because obviously we would like to constantly just go on trips and mm -hmm. chase 
sites and document that, right? Like that's yeah. oh, interesting yeah. Oh, yeah. to do, but that's also usually the most time consuming piece to do. And, you know, mm -hmm. then now you turn out a lot less content when you only do that. So it's, yeah. That's the thing we're always up against. You know, we're a fairly small team. We're churning out a ton of volume uh, as far as content and work for it's how small our team is. And then you want every piece to be a home run. You know, that's not reality, obviously, because you just like, right. you, like you say, everyone's attention span is so short. It's like you do something for them today. Well, tomorrow, well, what do you have for me tomorrow? You know, like, yeah. so it's mm -hmm. like, <laughs> you know, nobody ever sleeps yeah. on the internet. That's what I always say. So, oh, they consume it faster than you can put it out. It's wild. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. Yeah. And, and you know, the wild thing is, is like how long it takes just to film that 15 second piece. You know, me and Zach have talked about this. I'm sure you're right there with us, Jason. I tried to make one on a spinner bait, and it was just like, oh my gosh you spend you burn up three hours just trying to make that work and of course you know once you're trying to do this to show somebody it's like you've got the camera on you and it's it, you end up in that frustrating process where it's like okay this is working out great <laughs> we've, already, <laughs> we've already filmed all this b-roll up to this point i need you stupid fish let's go yeah and, and our our video team is super talented and so mm -hmm. I mean, like you know we have professional divers, professional drone pilots. We have, you know, POV things we can swim under the water and chase fish around with. Like we, and like we use a lot of technology in creating our stuff and we have really good like guys behind the camera that are, you know, highly intellectual, <laughs> very talented, know the equipment, can use the gear to its full capability, like way past my level anymore. So, because mm -hmm. I did the video stuff in the early days and mine next to theirs is junk, you know? So, <laughs> like, <laughs> and so I'm almost embarrassed anymore to make videos because it's just like, man, theirs is like just so much better than mine. But it's, but I like the documenting part of like, you're going and doing this. And like, I, I really like to do the things that are like, look, I've spent a year doing this thing. Here's what I found, like, and share mm -hmm. like the results of your fishing people. And so I've, I've been shooting a bunch of that this year to, to kind of release. So I'm, I'm interested to see how that goes. Obviously the, the production level won't be quite to what we're, what our standard has become, but our guys are really good about like, they, they shoot the long form stuff and then they can cut it up a million different ways for the short form stuff. You know, they've, We've built custom tanks where we can do ultra slow motion stuff underwater. Um, we shoot most of our underwaters in real natural environments. We're, we're fortunate the wired to fish headquarters up in Northern Minnesota and there's lots of like glacial lakes up there. So they have like 30 foot visibility and wow. very diverse, you know, ecosystems. So you can shoot on a bluff bank or you can shoot in standing timber or you're in vegetation or you're on the river, you know, like, so, and they can get in a lot of different environments and shoot stuff exactly like it needs to be shot. So that regard, we're super fortunate. We can do a lot of things nobody else can do just, just based on where we are and, and the, the level of expertise our guys have with the camera and gear and, and, and knowing what to shoot. And they have just, they all just have incredible good eye, you know, behind the camera, how to make a scene and tell a story. So we're blessed in that regard, but it's still like, you know, trying to churn it out at the, at the pace we need to churn it out is, is taxing yeah. for us. Cause we also, you know, on top of doing all that for our own site, we also do production work. So we're, we're shooting those launch videos for Rapala and Minn Kota and some mm -hmm. of these big brands. We're doing that behind the scenes for them. So, you know, so we're having to juggle our own content with making content for other folks. And, you know, again, yeah. we small team we use a handful of freelancers to help us with some of the editing and some of the shooting in the field but most of it it's it, you know it's three guys doing the bulk of the work so how much like when you look back at wired to fish you, you come in and would you say 2010 right mm -hmm. so how much have you seen this whole thing evolve i mean what's that process been like of the evolution of wired to fish from where it was to where it is today yeah, we got here. What I tell people, we got here with brute force because we didn't know any better. So it was just like, well, we don't know. Let's just try it. Oh, that didn't yeah. work. That flopped. You know, we'll quit doing that. Let's try this. Oh, well, that was a home run. Like, let's do more of that. You know, and so we kind of brute forced our way through it all, figuring out the social media and um, building audiences and then, you know, listening to the audience, trying to make the content that people actually want. Um, we were really good at that for a number of years and, and we're still good at it to an extent right now we're 
we're kind of getting wider. So it gets, it gets a little more difficult, you know, where we were almost centrally focused on bass fishing. We've now we've, you know, we've worked in pan fish and now we're starting to get into fly fishing and we've done ice fishing and we're doing some other species and we're not going to do any less bass fishing. We're just going to layer this other stuff on top of it. So um, because we know our core audience are, are bass anglers. And so we're, we want to stay true to that, but there are so many, like you go and look at like, like I'm into red ear fishing, right? Just like go out and look for red ear information. There's none. There's like no information on the internet. <laughs> it's incredible. Right? Like, so, and I was just like, there's like so many un underserved niches inside of fishing. You know, it's like, hmm. like there's a lot of fly fishing content. There's hardly any cat fishing content. There's hardly any, you know, specific types of panfish content. There's very little walleye content. You know, it's, there's only a handful of people doing that stuff. So it would be nice if we could use our resources to, to, to reach some of the audiences that I think have been kind of underserved with content, but while also not taking away from our bass audience, which is how we built the company. So yeah, that evolution has been interesting for us. It's, somewhat challenging to, again, just cause we're, we're not a very big team. Right. And if you try to do everything, you won't be good at anything. So we, right. we want to, you know, like the fly fishing thing, it's, I have fly fished a couple of the other guys have fly fished. I, I did it for 10 years in Arkansas, but I haven't picked up a fly rod in 10 years, you know? So now I'm just getting right. back into it. I don't need to pretend like I know everything about fly fishing. Right. No, I'm having to lean on freelance fly fishing writers and anglers to, make the content, you know, cause I don't want to try to come across as an expert when I haven't been doing it for 10 years. I'm basically a beginner again, starting all over. So, right. Then, so that's my angle, but you know, I'm going to bring in guys who are experts to, to help us make content, to ramp that up. So. Awesome. Yeah. And, and you talk about those niches and that, that is something I see on my end too. I mean, you know, bass obviously being the biggest niche because I mean, let's face it, it's a, it's a juggernaut with, you know, the money in the industry and the pros and the different things. Whereas you look at catfishing, you look at uh, pan fishing, crappie fish, crappie fishing's there's a, there's a little bit more out there about crappie fishing, but it's still not nearly as big as bass. And I think, you know, there is, there is a need for a lot of that because there is a lot of people that are getting on the YouTube space and, and trying to learn. And it's good if they've got that information, especially from a reliable, um, source yeah so uh, that's that's been a interesting evolution and then just yeah the 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 way people's attention spans have changed you know so it's um we still like to do the long form content we still think that's the right way to do it to you know mm -hmm. provide people lots of information if they want to look at it all great if they don't great it's there if they do you know so um so we're still kind of in that model um, and that allows us to tell a broader story too. the longer we can make the content. So, um, but yeah, that's, again, you gotta make, you gotta make what people want. And, you know, it's interesting how you'll see how much attention, you know, 30 second stuff gets <laughs> versus the yeah. stuff, yeah. you know, that's 20 minutes. <laughs> so. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and, and there is a struggle yeah. to fit out every, every little piece of information that you want in 15 to 30 seconds. I mean, it, it just, it's tough. Right. Yeah. yeah I you like know. it too. When you, when you do the 30 second piece and then you go and look at the average watch time and it's still 12 seconds. <laughs> You're like, all right, well, I guess you need to go shorter. <laughs> yeah. Shorter. Right. But then I know how I watch Netflix anymore. I sit with like the fast forward button, like, uh, blah, 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 blah. <laughs> like <laughs> scrubbing through stuff. My wife can't stand it, but I'm just like, yeah, I got other stuff to do. I need to get to the end here. <laughs> that are scrubbing through the previews. No, not that, not that, not that, not that. Maybe that's yeah. why every, all the rest of the platforms on the uh, streaming services don't do that preview like Netflix does at the top of the TV. So you don't preview everything out and just mm -hmm. keep skipping. Right. That make it a little tougher on a feller. No, uh, so looking ahead as far as what's next where i mean you're already talking about you know wired to fish doing some of these other uh species and different things but uh what else is next in the process of evolution where kind of like where do you guys see it going in the next five to ten yeah I, that's a good question um i think i can see us going the, into saltwater at some point um 
again, it would be, you know, adding key pieces there that make sense because it's disingenuous for us to try to do saltwater content from Minnesota, right? You know, and I'm in Kentucky, mm -hmm. so, you know, we're not going to try to do something that, that doesn't make sense. We would want to build up a network of folks that are in coastal areas and, have, you know, are very well versed at this stuff that, that already have the authority there um to work with us and but yeah I, I think that's on our radar for down the road um you know layering in a few more species um yeah and then it's uh, you know i think we want to get more into the storytelling we kind of got away from that the last several years um just churning out a lot of things like um buyer's guides things like that um that that stuff serves the angling community, but I think the storytelling thing is a lot more interesting for people who are avid anglers, right? So, like, I know for me, like, the YouTube stuff I watch, I watch, you know, there's a guy down in Texas or Louisiana that, that fishes on Lake of the Pines in Texas. He crappie fishes Charlie Burrow. You know, I watch his videos all the time. I watch uh, uh, Jay and Cole. Um, I like them a lot in Arkansas. And that's kind of a nostalgia thing for me. They fish in a lot of places that I grew up fishing. So it's fun for me to watch their videos. But again, it's just, they're going on a fishing trip and documenting it. You know, that's what their videos are. Mm -hmm. And that's the stuff I enjoy watching. So I'm like, we probably need to do more of that. Like, I think, mm -hmm. you know, if that's the stuff I like to watch, I got to believe there's other people that that's the stuff they like to watch too. So. And I think, you know, for me and Zach, we both watch, we're both geeks on Brandon Polinick's videos, but and Scott Martin as well is, is also because he did it first technically, but you fought, look at what they have done with the introduction of different characters into their videos. Like a lot of people, they, Kyle, it, Brandon's cameraman is, is just about as popular as Brandon anymore. And then, <laughs> yeah. you know, Scott Martin is, has brought in, he, of course he had Brandon, his Brandon there at first. Um, and he, he, grew fame and billy grew fame and now he's got his cameraman that he he's dealing with now and you know they're kind of building their own legend along this whole thing and it's it's neat and you'll see a lot of you'll hear a lot of people it's like yeah i just watched the travel videos for scott martin it's like I, I don't watch the whole tournament video i just like the travel video because it's like that vlog through so i mean it's kind of neat to see that there is still some of that, that people like the stories and, and the different things that these characters around our pros have made um, in their videos. Yeah, I, yeah, I think we, you know, the more we can share on the water experiences, I think that's, you know, while also delivering content that helps people, you know, catch fish. So I think if you can have a good mix of the two of those things, you, you, you'll you'll win in the content game. Um, you know, I I don't ever want us to become a content farm where we're just churning out pieces for clicks. I, I'm not interested in that. So that's not a route mm -hmm. we'll go. But um, you know, if you can put a lot of technical information into stuff, um, as well as you know, telling a story or sharing an adventure while you're doing that, then I think you have the perfect piece of content. Yeah, no, absolutely. Recipe. Yeah, we we are big on the proof of concept thing, right? So we, you know, we test products for a long time before we turn the reviews around because we want to prove to ourselves that yeah, it'll catch fish and okay, it's this is the scenario that it's best suited for in our opinion. Um, so not just yeah, the lure worked on this one pond or whatever. No, we actually take it out on the big lake and spend a month with it and oh, you know, it's pretty good at this, but it's really good at this. And, you know, that takes a little bit of time to figure that out. You're not going to figure that out in one trip with something. So um, we we do spend quite a bit of time with that, but we need to get better at sharing those experiences. Um, you know, mm -hmm. our, our deal with proof of concept is, you know, we always want to prove that the lures work, that the lures catch fish, that the tackle catches fish, that the techniques catch fish. So we we got to do you know we still have work there to improve you know showing that we do a really good job in our videos of showing that especially the ones we shoot with pros um we need to do more of that ourselves um so we have a good mix we we obviously we shoot a lot of video with pros but we also have you know kobe's the federation championship champion from minnesota last year so he's the best bass angler in minnesota and he's on our team on the video team so 
Um, so we have really good sticks on our team that can also provide a lot of good information on their own. Um, Sam Hangy came from the Auburn fishing teams, a very good stick. So it's like, yeah, we need to take people in the boat with us and show that we actually know what we're talking about here. And so we've not done that a lot. We've kind of put other people first. And so we're, we're finding out more and more as we do our own content, share our own stuff, that that's the stuff that really resonates with people. So I think we'll see a lot more of that as we go forward. That's actually a really good question. Um, when a new technique or a new lure presentation comes out, what I mean, you guys are obviously seeing some of this before a lot of us see it. You're you're seeing it in the build up to iCast before iCast ever relaunches the product and building this content. How long does it take sometimes to go through and, and learn something that's just brand new? That's I mean, you don't even you can't even say it's your style yet because you know you're trying it for the first time. Yeah, I, I mean it. it, it it's hard to say. Um, generally speaking, we'll see stuff a year in advance. Um, so we'll have a little bit of a leg up on people. Um, some things have been out there for a while, like BFS fishing, you know, like guys have been doing that for 10 years, but for some reason, like in the last two years, it's really exploded. So there's a lot more people interested in that. It's crossing over, you know, it kind of, kind of originated in the trout fishing area. It was kind of where there was a lot of that, you know, it's very technical in Japan. So they, they build really technical rods and reels for throwing super tiny lures to catch these really hard to catch trout. Mm-hmm. And then it, it kind of morphed over into bass fishing. And, um, but now that, you know, it's still really hard to get stuff. It's most of it's still in Japan. You've got to, you know, use websites like Digitaka to find, find the gear. And, but there's, there's guys over here now stateside, like Amir at bait finesse empire, you know, he's getting direct relationships with those Japanese companies where he can be the distributor in the U S So now it's becoming available to a lot more people. So it's growing and it's really taken off in the pan fish area. That's where a lot of people are employing that. There's still a lot of guys doing it for bass fishing. There's some guys that have gone exclusively to that. So that's, so yeah, it's hard to say, you know, something like that was out for 10 years, but now it's kind of caught on with the masses in the last couple of years. And we knew about it a couple of years ago and, um, just had dabbled with it a little bit. Like I say, there wasn't, we don't like to do things, you know, like we, we try not to do a lot of content with stuff that people can't get. Right. And so it's, it's like, yeah, we knew about it two years ago, but nobody could get anything stateside. So right. you know, what's the point of doing a bunch of content that that's hard for people to actually acquire the gear and go do it. So right. now that'll be a lot more fun. Um, now that it's getting readily available for people over here. Um, but yeah, so the, and then there's other things, you know, obviously the, the forward facing sonar, we had some of the early ones of that. We had the original pan optics before it was live scope and had mm-hmm. played around with that. So we've been in that for since the beginning of that technology. Um, so we're really well versed at it now um, just because we've kind of rode the whole wave with it. Um, but yeah, like the live scope plus I had it, I think like four or five months before it was available to the public. So I'd already ramped up and figured out all the settings and all that before it was available to everyone. So that, which helps us because then we can release a con piece of content that like helps people set their units up as soon as they get it, when it becomes available. Right. You have NDAs with most of the manufacturers, so they know we're, we're not going to jam them up and release anything early. So we'll sit on it till they tell us it's okay. And, but it helps us to have the stuff ahead of time, like you said, so we can get real familiar with it, make a really good piece of content. And then as soon as it's available for the public, we can explain people how to use it or adopt this new technique. Mm-hmm. It is just, I mean, it is super helpful because I, I know Zach and I both, like when something new comes out, we're always looking and trying to research more about it. So it always is good to see these other videos on whatever they are, cameras, phones whatever you're looking at those reviews just to see okay do i really want this do i not want it what's the benefit of having it compared to what i have and it goes a long way i think you know and there's a lot of products that sometimes it's just shut up and take my money (laughs) (laughs) i've had a lot of people complain to me how much money i've I've, I've cost them <laughs> so, yeah. and I have some guys that have cost me a lot of money. So I, I feel their pain. <laughs> yeah, no, absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. for sure. So Kentucky Lake, the home, the home area you are from Benton. 
the Benton area of Kentucky. Um, let's talk a little bit about that process. I learned a lot from you when we when we hung out for that day, mm-hmm. um, just talking about the process that has gone into Kentucky Lake. And I think it's important for other people to hear this. Um, this is, you know, really why I wanted to have you on. I, I love wired to fish, but Kentucky Lake is a place that's near and dear to my heart. The people down there are fantastic. We actually know a lot of the same. But um, let's talk about the rehabilitation process that's gone on to this um, lake ever since things have gotten started. What are some of the things that, um, well, first off, what can you tell us about the lake and, and some of the things that are going on? Sure. So, yeah, so it's obviously it's a passion area for me because I live here and a ton of my friends have businesses here that revolve around the lake, right? So it's... Um, yeah, like the the last carp spawn was in 2015. That's the last documented one. Um, that's what everyone blames because it just happened to kind of coincide with when the decline started happening. So it really wasn't carp, but that's what everyone wants to blame it on because there were so many of them in the system at that time. Um, what actually happened was the TVA was messing with the water levels. And I say messing, but they weren't intentionally doing it. They 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 have a job, obviously, to keep a navigable waterway from flooding people's <laughs> homes, right? So <laughs> um, the lake was flooding. Um, right. It was getting above summer pool um, before it's time for it to be summer pool. So it doesn't have to be summer pool till May 1st here. And so unfortunately for us, the, the bass wolf come to spawn in April. And so the lake is not all the way up sometimes when they come. So what the the... The scenario for us that happened was there in 13, 14, 15, we had high waters prior to summer pool. So the lake went way up into the bushes, way back into yards. The bass ran up there to spawn and the TVA said, hey, it's not time to be summer pool. Let's pull the water back down. Well, then they pulled the water back down below where all the bass had put their beds. And now all the beds are high and dry. So we basically had like terrible spawns in 13, 14, 15 takes four and a half, five years for a bass to get to 15 inches on Kentucky Lake. So you extrapolate that forward. Well, that means 2018, 2019, 2020, you should start seeing not real good bass fishing if you don't have spawns from those year classes. So we basically had three years of no year class of bass. So it knocked this huge hole in the population because bass don't live forever. People seem to forget that too. Like, Cause you know, people get mad when guys keep a 10 pounder. Well, that fish is like 15 years old, you know? So right. he's, he's not going to live forever. <laughs> and so yeah. the big fish started dying off and there was no fish to replace them in those. We were, cause we had missing year classes. Mm-hmm. So we're cycling back from that now. What's interesting on all that. So when that carp thing happened, like 18, 19, they had an effect on the plankton in the lake and it affected the shad in the lake. So like all of our bait disappeared like 2018. So you wouldn't see, you wouldn't see any shad in the fall. And if you've ever been here in the fall, you can walk across the shad in the backs of the bays. That's what Kentucky Lake's been known for. Well, then in 18, you don't see a shad in the fall. Like, like, so you go from being covered with it to having none. So that obviously had an impact. So that's slowed our process down a little bit. Um, but so now it's cycling back. So we had good spawns in like 16, 17, 18, we started having good spawns. Well, you know, those fish are just now coming into keeper size. Um, so we're starting yeah, to, get a lot, yeah, we're starting to get a lot more large mouth keepers. And I'm speaking mostly about large mouth here because small mouth are completely different than the way they act. What's interesting is small mouth that that population went like crazy. Um, so now we've got lots of three to five pound smallmouth in the lake. And so that's kind of dominated Kentucky Lake the last year. Um, This spring, there was a Toyota series on the lake. The guy that came in first, Jake Lawrence, friend of mine, never had fished for smallmouth on the north end of the lake. He's been fishing tournaments here for 10 years. He's never fished smallmouth on the north end of the lake. Goes through his practice down south, doesn't do any good, comes up here for a day. He's like, oh my God. (laughs) <laughs> like he's like was blown away how many smallmouth were shallow that he could catch and so he started running that pattern and ends up winning the tournament um guy that came in second harbor Lovin, another friend of mine works for jinko same thing he was on the exact same program as jake the third place guy was from minnesota he was on the same exact program all smallmouth um he said at the weigh-in the guy from minnesota said 
He has fished all over the country. He lives in smallmouth country. He said Kentucky Lake is the best smallmouth like he's ever fished in the spring. That's how good wow. his fishing is. He said he caught a hundred keeper smallmouth every day. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> so that sounds that sounds like a terrible time. I don't know why anybody wanted to do so, that. So what's interesting is so I was like, huh, well, I wonder what's going on with all this. So I went out after that tournament, like a week later, was like, let me just scan around and just see what's going on out here. And so I found an area with a bunch of stumps. I I caught probably 60 smallmouth over three pounds the first day. It was like what is going on? <laughs> like started wire guy out of the lake, and it was unbelievable. For like two weeks, I just hammered on them. It was incredible, and so so now we have all these big smallmouth in the system. We're getting keeper largemouth coming back, and 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 don't get me wrong, there's a handful of big ones still in the lake, right? E even when you have mm -hmm. bad year classes, it doesn't mean you had no fish. You just right numbers knock back so much. It appears because we went from like. You could go in any bay and catch bass on Kentucky Lake, right? Well, now, it, then it went to you couldn't find them on a ledge for like two years. They didn't even go out to the ledges. Mm -hmm. And so now we're we're cycling back. So we had a little bit of a ledge season this year. I figured next year it will be better. But I would say in two years here, this place will be remarkable because there'll be tons of big smallmouth and there'll be tons of big largemouth. So, I mean, you got, you're going to have 25-pound bags that'll be mixed bags, largemouth and smallmouth. So it'll, it'll start to feel like the old Kentucky Lake, but it's, you know, I've talked with the game and fish guys a bunch. We have an awesome biologist, Adam Martin. That's the fisheries lead for our area. He is awesome. So he really understands what happened here, what's going on. Their big focus has been putting habitat in spawning areas. So for the last three years, they've been putting out laydowns, um, They've been cutting, they've got permits from the LBL, from the TVA to cut down trees on the LBL side. And, the, and the, all of the cover they're putting in the lake is for nothing more than to make sure the spawns survive, to give the bass something to spawn on if the lake's not at summer pool. They've planted cypress trees. Um, they work with the, the Bass Federation Nation. They, the, fe the Federation Nation gets grants and then they coordinate with Adam's team and then they go put cover into the lake. So mm -hmm. it's one of these weird deals with the game and fish. You can't take like donations and give them money because it goes into a fund. And then that fund may not get allocated back to Adam and his group. Right now, yeah. Adam's budget is like $1,800 a year to put cover in the lake for both lakes. That's Barkley and Kentucky. $1,800. <laughs> so you can't do oh. much with 1800 bucks. So I won't cover no. the gas for the chainsaws. Right. <laughs> no. So, but yeah, they've put out like 1,200 spawning bun benches in uh, Lake Barkley in one year. They've cut down hundreds of trees. Um, they've, they've been putting these spawning beds out. So they, they like put these like concrete things down and fill them with gravel and they put them, they put them in select areas and then they go back and do their studies to see which bass are using which beds because they put the beds out like three different ways. They put a bed out just by itself. They put a bed next to something that was already in the water. And then they put a bed with one of their artificial trees there. And so, and then they can see like, Oh, the bass prefer it set up like this. And then that tells them how to go build more in the lake. So they're doing a lot to, it, it, because they know the thing that caused the problem was the lack of spawns. So, um, I think that, you know, what they're doing is the right way to attack this. Awesome. And as far as the vegetation and the grass, I know a lot of people talk about that. Um, are you seeing any of that start to, I know for our lakes here, we, we kind of talked about this a little bit. Um, it's taken, it's taken a few years, but we're starting to see it coming back and it's, it's awesome to see. Are you guys starting to see anything coming back yet? No grass yet. Um, we we have high hopes because there's so much grass up and down Pickwick right now. And we kind of mm -hmm. follow behind what Pickwick does. So like when our grass came back, I don't know, five, six years ago, it's it was right after Pickwick's grass had been so thick down there. So it's kind of like, okay, if their grass comes back, then ours will hopefully come back next. Here's the whole issue. So all of the lakes along the TVA don't fluctuate like Pickwick does and like we do and we fluctuate the most so we can hold more water than everybody so they'll let our lake go up 15 feet if it needs to because of rains and flooding or whatever um right that's what hurt our grass is so right at the time the grass is trying to germinate they let like 12 feet of water go on top of it right when it's starting to come up and then it doesn't get the sunlight so none of the right. grass gets a foothold and then it all disappears so you have what you have is like 
super heavy current and really high levels of water, which is like the two worst things you can have for having grass in a fishery. <laughs> and so, and it's just because we fluctuate so much. And so if we can have a real stable couple of springs, I think the grass will come back. You know, basically the grass is going to get fed to us from Pickwick. <laughs> and then you know, hopefully we have a stable spring or two and then we have a chance for the grass to come back. So no, I've not heard of any, even down South of Paris, I've not heard of any grass. Now, how much of that, like when you look at the river system between Kentucky Lake and Pickwick, how, how soon do you start seeing that in that river system coming towards the lake? What do you mean? Like, well, you've got the Pickwick Dam, you know, down from it. Will the grass start growing so far down from the Pickwick Dam and then start yeah, I, its way towards the lake? Yeah, it, to me, I think it it's it it depends on where it ends up. Like, because you'll see grass back in bays, but then you'll also see it out on the islands. So, mm -hmm. yeah, I I don't you want it's there's not a rhyme or reason to how. Um, you know, where the grass is going to come back to me, I think it's where the water is like the perfect clarity. It's stable. You have the right temperatures right at the time that grass wants to germinate. Right. So it's, it ha it's like this perfect window that we seem to never get right. Cause it's always like, okay, the grass is just starting to get a foothold. Oh, and now we got like tons of rain and we're getting all this current and oh, the water got real dirty. So now there's no light penetration. Oh, and it's way oh. too high now, you know? So, and then it's like, okay, no grass again. <laughs> you know, So if we could kind of ever get over that hump, I think, you know, it will come back on its own because it, it went away like, 15 years ago. And then all of a sudden it came back again and everybody's like, okay, well the grass is back, you know, like, so yeah, that I, it's hard to predict like when it's going to be back or where it's going to show up. Cause it was weird. Like there was all kinds of grass down South. And then there was just a handful of places up North where it was like here, there, there, you know, but it wasn't everywhere. So it was just like, it right. went to a certain point and then just kind of faded away. Cause the North end of Kentucky lakes, obviously a lot deeper than the South end. So you'll see it down south yeah. first. You know, that that grass has a better chance down there than it does up on our end. The uh, Talking about the shad, are you guys starting to see the bait coming oh, back? It's unbelievable. Yeah, like the most shad I've seen maybe ever in the whole time I've lived here. So I've been here since 2005. And yeah, this is the most shad I've ever seen in the lake. Like I put the boat in Sunday, the entire ramp was covered in shad and both Threadfin and giant gizzards feeding there on the algae on the ramp, all along the pocket next to the ramp, all going out, flickering like it's everywhere. It, and it's what's weird is like it's all the way in the back in the shallowest water you can find, and it's out in twenty five feet of water right now. It's it's literally everywhere across the whole lake. So it's wow. like the perfect storm for our lake to like explode. I would say like a rig fishing will be unbelievable this year. The fish will be. Cause it was really good last winter. So it will probably be like lights out this winter. Now, how much, um, like through the winter, I know, you know, a lot of people, a lot of us will flock to Del Hollow and, and the big Eastern Highland reservoirs and all that fun stuff. How, how good is Kentucky like in the winter? It's like my favorite time to fish here is November, December, a little bit into January. I, I like when they they get real predictable. So they push off into deep holes and they group up and they group up with everything. <laughs> and so mm -hmm. you'll catch a hundred fish and you might have, you know, two and three and four pound white bass. You're going to catch big small mouth. You're going to have giant crappie. I mean, it's, it's incredible what you'll catch in one in the same place. Basically you're making the same cast over and over and over and over again and catching everything that's in the lake pushed off in these holes so they get real predictable. Like there's a really good swim bait bite, jerk bait bite that happens in December. December is one of my favorite months to fish because that, like I say, like I know exactly where to go look for them. They get in the same places every year. And um, it's like, you know, deep little run-ins going into like first pocket or two going into a bay or, you know, pocket right off the main lake. They're just in the mouths of these run-ins in deep water. And you can run around with a swim bait, an A-rig, blade bait. Um, some jerk baiting, mm -hmm. but yeah, it's, I, I just like it because it's real predictable. There's hardly anyone on the water. 
<laughs> so you don't have oh, to yeah. fight to get on places like you do in the spring and summer. So, right now, um, we was talking a little bit about the fish size before everything started. We kind of compared compared some numbers just a little bit, but the lake is fishing from our Jackson Kayak um, Championship event that we had with USA Bass and and just kind of what you've seen. It's very competitive fishing actually right now. You maybe you're not catching the mon monsters that you did have before, but it, the the fishing is competitive as it'll get right now. Mm -hmm. yeah for sure there, there's like i say like it'll get it'll seem like it got really good but it's again i think it's fish getting in predictable places right and what people don't understand like when you have a huge population of fish a lot of things are predictable right like you can go do a lot of different things and catch fish because there's so many fish spread out over so many areas when, when oh, yeah. you have that size population they only get in a handful of places and you need to be able to predict those places they go to right so it Mm -hmm. So like, like this time of year, like the places they get, they're very susceptible to, to a rig fishermen. So it's going to seem like all of a sudden fishing got really good here. Well, they, they got in real predictable places and, you know, they're feeding really heavily right now. So it's going to, the weights are going to seem really big. I think this winter, you know, there's gonna be lots of over 20 pound bags caught. But yeah, I mean, all, all summer, all spring, spring was really good. I mean, there's, it was, it was lots of 20 pound bags, lots of 15 to 20 pound bags, most of them being smallmouth. So, um, yeah, it was real competitive all through the spring and summer, um, fall. It, this place is always quirky in the fall, September, the, the fish roam so much on bait and there's so much bait you're in competition with that. So it can make the fishing real sporadic, but then that's why I like November, December so much. Cause that it kind of quits being sporadic and they get in real predictable places and they get in there by the hundreds. So that's what makes it really fun. Right. So yeah. mm -hmm. now talking about the lake, let's talk about the area around the lake just a little bit, because these are the people that matter to you and I, um, obviously at the end of the day, the most, and we want to see them have success as much as we want to have success fishing. Um, How's the how's the tourism been? What can you tell us about that end of Kentucky Lake? Because there's a lot, like we you alluded to at the start of this thing, man. There's a lot of people that, I mean, they live off of this this lake and the recreation that comes with it. Yeah, we kind of had the double whammy here for a little bit because we we had kind of this decline of largemouth bass fishing on Kentucky Lake at the same time COVID hit. <laughs> so the lake we kind of you know the people that live by tourism here kind of got the double whammy so the last couple of years it's been really good like as far as people coming to the lake because we kind of turned into a recreational lake a little bit um mm -hmm. over a couple of years there was you know with the whole covid thing nobody could go anywhere so they ended up just going to their local lake they bought pontoons they bought stuff to to, to kind of vacation around the house if if you will so um, that's been really strong. Um, there's starting to be more tournaments coming back to the lake. So obviously in our heyday, pretty much every small tournament trail in the Midwest had their championship on Kentucky Lake. Um, so it was nothing to have a thousand tournament boats on the lake every single weekend. And so we haven't seen that in a few years, but I know there's, there's an FLW event coming here next year. There's talks of an open coming here. So I think, you know, it's going to start to cycle back as those big tournaments. Because honestly, me, I haven't wanted those big tournaments to come here because the fishing hasn't been good, right? And it's not good when a tournament comes to your place that it's come to a hundred times and it was lights out and then they come back and they're like, oh, it's terrible now. Well, you don't want them to go and tell everybody that, right? Like, well, it's right. not terrible. It's just different, you know? So um, the, the smallmouth fishing obviously is kind of carrying us right now. I think once that largemouth population gets back to where it was, then the lake's going to be like it always was. It's just, it, the, people don't realize that four or five year period it takes to cycle back a year class. So, and if you have three or four years of that, whew, yeah, that's yeah. a long recovery period. So it's, I mean, it was like watching a family member die, you know, like I make my living on Kentucky Lake. Like I, you know, I need to go test product where I was so spoiled. I could take, a box full of new things and go out to it. Like I know where a school is. Let's go out here and see if they'll, they'll, what they like and don't like, you know, and 
Mm-hmm. In the last couple of years, man, you could go all day and maybe catch five keepers. You know, like it's tough to get your work done when it's like that. And, and I started just traveling and going and fishing in other places. And so now it's it's been nice this year where I've been able to get so much work done at home again because I, <laughs> yeah, I miss that. You know, we took it all for granted for so long, and now it's like, okay, yeah, I think that that day's coming back. You know, will it be next year? Will it be the year after? I kind of lean towards next year is going to be a lot better. But I think in like two years, this will be the place everybody wants to come. So, yeah. Yeah. And for those of you guys watching, get down there, go check out the lake. There's more than just the lake, too. Paducah's got a lot of nice things going on. Um, then, then you've got the land between the lakes, which is awesome. It's an awesome little area. Go see some elk, go see some bison, um, get to know that little piece of conservation and how that, that area has been instrumental in helping to rebuild the elk herd out in Eastern Kentucky. Um, so there's, there's a lot there. There's a lot to see, a lot of knowledge to gain. There's good pizza. There's good burgers. There's good beers. (laughs) What more could you want? It's a great place to go hang out. And there's amazing tackle shops like Kentucky Lake Outdoors and, and some of the others that are spread out through there. Yeah, um, Eddie's High Tech Outdoors. Like we're blessed to like have so many good tackle shops on one lake. Like you go to some lakes, yeah. there's only one good tackle shop there. And we have like gas station three tackle really shops. Good ones, right. Like we have like three really good ones. We have like one of the best marine installers in the nation in our backyard. Like and like places like fast Eddie's that has a restaurant that's like, you know, standing Mm -hmm. only every time you go in there. So, you know, like it's, we're real blessed to have so much built around the lake um, for people to enjoy places like the brew house, you know, not too far down Mm -hmm. the road. And so, yeah, we're, it's good that, that, that everything's kind of cycled back now. Cause you know, I know for a year or so that those, those places were really struggling just because people weren't coming to the lake and, um, so I'm happy everybody was kind of able to weather the storm and now people are, are, are getting to see how good we have it here. And Wyatt jumping into the comments here says the hospitality of the local people was amazing. It, it really, it really is. You, you're not going to meet a nicer group of people and, and talking about the tackle shops, you know, you go to the North side of Pickwick and the best tackle shop is, is right there in Yellow Creek at a gas station. Mm-hmm. And Del Hollow, the best tackle shop that I've been to around Del Hollow is at a gas station. So, you know, you've mm-hmm. got these tackle shops down at Kentucky Lake that are truly world renowned. And mm-hmm. hopefully will be a hopefully there'll be a day again when, you know, kids can go down there and see their favorite pros driving up and down the road like it was just going out of style again. Those were always the cool times to go down there and see all the ranked boats running up and down everywhere. Yeah, we joke here because, you know, so we um, we help the high school teams a lot, donate tackle and whatever, and come speak at their team meetings and go to their tournaments and stuff. And I was like, you know, there's a whole bunch of these kids. They've literally never seen ledge fishing at, at, at Kentucky Lake, you know, and it's like mm-hmm. we saw it for 10 years and it was like, wow, they have no idea what we're talking about. We, like you tell them like, oh, yeah, we had 100 fish days all the time. And it was like pretty much every time you went, it was like that. They're like what are you talking about like like, like, (laughs) it's like oh yeah you guys never did get to see that you were like eight years old (laughs) man damn just drove there on the weekends for funsies oh yeah (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) well how many how many videos by the pros were actually filmed on that lake back in the day i mean hundreds oh yeah it was so nice we it was we there were a lot of riders events here you know where I could sleep in my own bed and drive down and meet everyone in the morning and shoot all day and go back home and sleep in my bed again. Like, <laughs> cause you could get a lot of work done here in a single day. <laughs> so, oh yeah. <laughs> Can't hate yes, that. No, no I, I, you know, it'd been, I've told you it'd been since uh, Lambert caught the hundred pounds in the FLW right before they became MLF. That was the last time I was there uh, working with Jackson kayak. And then, you know, <clears throat> went away for a while and, Man, it was it was so nice to get. I didn't realize how much I missed it all until I got back down there, and then I felt bad for not being one of those people that really didn't weather the storm and, and keep going. And yeah, it's all still there, and it's all still just as awesome. And Southern hospitality is just as good as it's always been. Oh yeah, maybe even better now because people appreciate you know like 
that folks come here and, <laughs> you know, like, yeah, you know, it's like, it, like I say, like all of us took it for granted, right? What we had in our backyard. We mm-hmm. always think that this is God's country because, you know, we have incredible fishing and we have great deer hunting and turkey hunting. And like, if absolutely, you're, if you're an outdoorsman. This is a special place to live. Right. And so, yeah. You take all that for granted until it gets taken away. And then you're like, oh, you know, maybe we shouldn't, you know, just <laughs> not be grateful for it when it's good, you know, like. <laughs> yeah. Just come visit Indiana folks every now and then you'll, you'll get a quick reminder on how. <laughs> all the Indiana folks I visit are down here. <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah, we all, and we moved down there in, in droves. I mean. <laughs> I, I don't think that there's a time. It doesn't matter if I go to Del Hollow or Kentucky. Like I always run into somebody that has moved down from Indiana to this area. Mm-hmm. So it's crazy. I mean, they get down to Tennessee, Kentucky, and they just decide, hey, it gets cold, but it doesn't get that cold. <laughs> right. Tolerable cold. Right. That's oh, yeah. the best way to put it. Yeah. Tolerable, tolerable cold where it's at. That's what I've decided. <laughs> so well jason we've got you at an hour and five minutes so what zach and i like to do at the end of this podcast is let our guests tell them uh tell the folks at home you know where to find you on the socials and um obviously thank anybody um that you need to thank that you work with and and that helps you out along the way yeah no uh pretty easy wired to fish.com this website and pretty much wired to fish on any social media instagram's weird we had to do wired to fish official there because somebody was squatting on the wired to fish it wouldn't get off <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah. so we're wired to fish official on instagram but we're wired to fish on everything else so you can find us pretty easy there and yeah no i mean i i appreciate the angling community um in general, I mean, I, obviously, I love the fishing industry, and there's way too many good people that we work with to name everybody. But um, the fact that people come to our website, come to our social media, comment, watch our stuff, compliment us, you know, tell us when we're screwing up. <laughs> so I, I appreciate all of that. I appreciate the feedback. The fact that somebody will give you, you know, five minutes of their day every day is is not taken for granted by us so we definitely appreciate all those folks cool deal well folks that's going to wrap it up for this 30 41st edition of the orion podcast be sure to head over to spotify google and all the uh, streaming networks um watch the playback listen to us and uh yeah you can catch all the uh, episodes and more jackson kayak doc talk um we will be back thursday night we've got a brand new episode of jackson kayak doc talk rumor has it we've got a special guest host um you guys will just have to wait and see i'm i'm not going to be hosting one so it'll be a good episode for everybody at home they're probably tired of me at this point so without further ado good night everybody later thanks guys hey no problem man glad to have you it was awesome